Welcome to this Sussex Universe lecture. For this talk we have Professor Louise Serple from Biochemistry who's going to continue our departure from maths and physics and talk to us about Alzheimer's disease. Hello, my name is Louise Serple. Uh, I'm a professor of biochemistry at the University of Sussex and um, my research focuses on understanding the causes of Alzheimer's disease. So that's what I'm going to try and um, explain uh, a little bit about um, today. Um, so I should say that I um, have a research group and um, there are around eight people uh, working with me at the moment and many more have passed through my lab um, and they are the ones who do all of the experimental work so they'll, their work is what I will be talking about today. Um, so I'm going to start off by um, introducing my topic. I'm going to say a little bit about Alzheimer's disease and what it is. Um, then I'm going to say a little bit more about um, the pathology in Alzheimer's disease um, and the sort of work we're doing to understand it better. And then finally, I'm going to try and end with some good news in terms of thinking about therapeutics and so on. Um, so I'm going to start up my slides. And <clears throat> so, um, I've named my talk Untangling Alzheimer's Disease, and Alzheimer's disease, this is really to reflect how complicated a disease it is. It really is uh, really complex, um, understanding what causes the, the disease. Um, it was actually discovered in um, around 1904 by Alois Alzheimer, and, and yet um, over 100 years later, we still... Uh, don't know all that much about the disease and we certainly don't know yet how to cure it. And in the background here, what you can see is some brain cells. So these are neurons and you can see this sort of network entangled meshwork of these cells that are basically what underlie um, your brain. So um, each one of these cells um, connects with another one um, and signals um, to provide you with memories and so on. Um, and so we can actually culture these in the lab. And so I'm going to say a little bit more about that um, in a little while. And so I work, um, as I said, from at the University of Sussex, and I work within um, Sussex Neuroscience. So I'm going to start off by introducing Alzheimer's disease. What exactly is it? Uh, well, you may have heard um, the term dementia and wondered what the difference is between dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And as you see here with my little icon, um, dementia really is an umbrella term and it encompasses all these other sorts of dementia. So as you see from this graph here, Alzheimer's disease is the most common form um, of dementia. And then we also have vascular dementia, which has some similarities with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, you may have come across frontal temporal dementia that's here, uh, FTD, uh, which has been more in the news um, in the last few years. Um, and then a number of other sorts of dementia uh, that come into this uh, red um, quadrant of the, of the graph. Um, so as I've said, Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia affecting the population. And so we focus um, mostly on Alzheimer's disease. Um, Alzheimer's disease affects around um, 520,000 people in the UK who are actually living with Alzheimer's disease at the moment. Um, and as you probably know, this um, disease is accompanied by progressive memory decline, uh, particularly short term memory. So you'll find often people who are living with dementia can remember things from perhaps from their childhood, but can't remember um, something from that morning. And so um, there's this very specific um, loss of memory, short term memory. It's also sometimes accompanied by agitation, um, disturbed sleep patterns, mood disturbances and occasionally delusions. Um, and as the disease progresses, we have a decline in language. Um, navigation skills can be impaired, concentrating and planning ahead um, and orientation. So knowing where you are in space and um, towards the end of the disease, it is also accompanied with an increasing frailty um, and uh, people tend to use, uh, require full-time care. So I'm not a clinician, I'm a biochemist and a neuroscientist, um, and so our work really does focus on um, the proteins and the molecular detail of what's happening in Alzheimer's disease. So that's where I'm going to focus. Uh, there are many people who are working on um, helping and um, developing ways in which people can live better with Alzheimer's disease and other sorts of dementia. So Alzheimer's disease is uh, 
is really characterized by two main pathologies, the amyloid plaques, which are shown here on the left-hand side, and the neurofibrillary tangles. The amyloid plaques, um, this shows a light micrograph showing the amyloid plaque in the brain tissue. And you can see that there's this very densely stained structure, which is formed extracellularly. So that means between the brain cells. And if we look using an electron microscope at the brain tissue of, of somebody who has died of Alzheimer's disease, we can see this big uh, deposition of protein structure here. And this protein structure is made up of these fibres, which are known as amyloid fibrils. And we can actually make these in the lab using the protein that, uh, that comprises these um, fibrils, and that's called amyloid beta. So um, amyloid plaques are formed of amyloid fibrils. They are extracellular, uh, so in between the neurons, and they contain amyloid beta. And then on the right-hand side, we have neurofibrillary tangles. Again, here's a light micrograph. This time, these neurofibrillary tangles are found within the neurons, so inside the brain cells. And you can see these as little flame-shaped structures. Um, but again, this is a deposition of a lot of structure protein structure, and these structures are made up of filaments. And this electron micrograph here actually shows you the filaments that are found in the brain tissue of um, somebody who's died of Alzheimer's disease. You, these are made of a protein called tau. And these, these filaments are known as paired helical filaments uh, because of this very specific structure that they have. So they have this pair of filaments that come together to form these twisted filaments. So uh, neurofibrillary tangles are formed of paired helical filaments. They're intracellular, so inside the brain cells, and they are made up of tau. What's interesting about this is that each one of these uh, pathologies has thought at various times to be the most important in terms of the cause of Alzheimer's disease. And yet, um, at this moment, we still don't really fully understand how they're involved uh, and what, what, which one is more important or which one comes first. So I want to tell you a little bit about what leads to Alzheimer's disease. So uh, in a small number of cases, uh, genetics is very important. So there can be inherited mutations that are found in genes in some patients. Uh, and these occur within the amyloid precursor protein, uh, which, as its name may suggest, is a precursor to the amyloid beta. So this is a large protein that is basically clipped and uh, produces the amyloid beta protein. Um, these two proteins, this, these two genes, presenilin 1 and presenilin 2, are actually those scissors, if you like. So they're enzymes that actually clip the precursor, amyloid precursor protein to produce amyloid beta. And gen, um, mu gene mutations in these proteins, presenilin 1 and presenilin 2, can also cause early onset Alzheimer's disease. And finally here, Down syndrome is characterized by three copies of chromosome 21. And chromosome 21 is where the amyloid precursor protein gene is housed. So essentially, this increases the, the amount of amyloid beta that's produced. So in these patients, uh, there tends to be an early onset form of Alzheimer's disease, um, often occurring when people are around uh, 40 or 50 years old. So this is around 5% of Alzheimer's uh, cases um, that are genetic, but most other cases are actually sporadic. We do know of a risk factor. So humans have um, a gene called apolipoprotein E, uh, and we can have E2, E3, or E4. And if you possess two copies of E4, then you have an increased risk of getting Alzheimer's disease at a later age, so 70 or 80 um, years old. And this little image here shows you um, the structure of this protein, the apolipoprotein E4. So one of the things that we're really focusing on in Sussex is to try and understand how this E4 actually increases the risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. But the main uh, risk of Alzheimer's disease is actually aging. And I'm sure you're all aware of that because as we age, the likelihood of us developing Alzheimer's disease increases. And we know also that there may be environmental and lifestyle factors that may increase our risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. And of course, this gives us some ideas about how we might live better in order to try to, um, to reduce our risk. Um, but we know that heart disease, stroke and diabetes may have a role to play in increasing maybe slightly our risk of getting Alzheimer's disease.
So now if we look at uh, what um, the genetics are actually doing, um, we can see a few patterns developing. So if we look back at this genetics in the pink box, <clears throat> I mentioned that the amyloid precursor protein is processed to make amyloid beta. The presenilins 1 and 2 are actually the machinery that makes a beta. And finally, Down syndrome uh, involves trisomy, so three copies of chromosome 21, as I said, and this uh, increases the amount of amyloid beta. So looking at this, we might think to ourselves, well, amyloid beta must be the most important uh, protein involved in the cause of Alzheimer's disease. Some of the evidence here is pointing towards the importance of amyloid beta. As I said, there are these other genetic risk factors, two genes for either apolipoprotein E2, E3 or E4. So I've put this rather complicated uh, composition here. So you can be E2, 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 E3, E3, E3 and so on, because each of us has two copies of genes. Um, and as I said already, E4, E4 increases the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease around 15 times and can lead to a slightly earlier onset disease. But uh, increasing the risk does not mean uh, that a person will definitely get this disease. So that's really important. But the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is aging, as I said. So aging leads to a decline in how proteins are controlled. So I've already said that those two major pathologies are made of proteins. We know that oxidative stress is very important as we age, that we accumulate oxidative stress. And we could have accumulated damage from environmental sources. So thinking about how um, that might impact on our risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. And then finally, what about tau? So I've said here that A beta is really important. I've said here that APOE is forming, has a role to play, and that aging is also very important. But what about tau? Well, interestingly, it turns out that actually there are a number of different uh, dementias that are known as the tauopathies. And in these diseases, tau is the primary uh, protein that's deposited. So it's the primary source of that pathology, if you like. So there's no amyloid beta, there's just tau. And so that tells us that this protein tau is enough to be able to provide uh, the risk of getting, a, uh, of a, getting a type of dementia. We can also look at the distribution of um, amyloid plaques and tau neurofibrillary tangles in the brain and think about whether these give us some clues about uh, which of these is causing the deficits that we see in patients who have Alzheimer's disease. Um, and as you can see, this is quite a complex issue. And if we look at this um, distribution of amyloid plaques, we see the distribution um, is quite even, whereas the distribution of tau is sort of all over the place. And what it's been shown by people is that generally the distribution of neurofibrillary tangles correlates better with cognitive decline. So how severe the disease is, whereas amyloid plaques uh, correlate much, much less well. So in order to try and understand Alzheimer's disease, we have to think about what evidence we already have. So we know these things are there. We know that there's protein deposited in the brain. So we think, uh, certainly from our point of view in our research, that these are playing an important role. So what the sorts of questions we want to ask are, how did they get there in the first place? And interestingly, how to think about the you know, people who don't have Alzheimer's disease, how do they prevent it from getting there? And then what do they do? So how do they cause that sort of uh, neurodegeneration, so degeneration of the brain tissue that leads to Alzheimer's disease? So they're the questions we want to ask. So in order to answer those questions, I just want to introduce you a little bit more to proteins. So cellular proteins are all about uh, processes, sorry. Cellular processes are all about proteins. So uh, this is a picture of a chromosome uh, that obviously produces your genetic, has your genetic material. Uh, this is a schematic of DNA that um, encodes all of your genes uh, and encodes the genes that then uh, get basically uh, developed into a protein chain, a chain of amino acids. So each one of these base, bases here, these set of bases, actually three bases, will encode a particular amino acid. Uh, so our genes basically tell us what proteins are going to be produced and how those proteins are made up. 
So we have these proteins and they're made up of amino acids. Now, what's important about proteins is that they are um, long chains of amino acids, but in order for them to function as proteins in our bodies for all the biological processes we need them to, they have to fold. And I just want to show you a little uh, YouTube video, which is quite noisy, so I might turn down the sound a little bit here. Um, and essentially, Oh, it doesn't play within. Okay, so it folds. So essentially, these proteins fold. So this essentially is sort of showing you what I mean by something folding. So we started off with a flat piece of paper, and then we can fold it into something new. So if I take that into um, the point of view of a protein here, you can see this protein chain here uh, that is now going to fold and collapse into a three-dimensional structure. So you can see that three-dimensional structure now building up. And actually, some of you may be able to see that these are made up of little helices. There are some beta strands in here. And beta strands and alpha helices are essentially the folding pattern that we see within proteins. There are other folding patterns too. But this is a three-dimensional structure. So this would perhaps be a functional protein that then goes on to do something. Now, I'm just going to stop this because my YouTube seems to be doing something. Um, <clears throat> but rather than restart, I'm going to keep going, I think. So uh, the proteins uh, fold and uh, this is what happens when they might misfold. So proteins may misfold, they may aggregate and assemble. Um, and so what this shows you is some little individual uh, protein chains, if you like. They're actually 10 amino acids long. And what we've done is we've take, put them in a box and given them a little shake. And what they're doing now is they are um, interacting with one another. They're aggregating to form new structures. And so hopefully what you can see here is that rather than just aggregating to form a sort of uh, disordered uh, blob or globule or something, they're actually ordering themselves in quite an organized way. So you can see these uh, protein chains are organizing themselves in little strands or lines that are interacting with one another to form a new structure. And this is what we think might be happening in these diseases like Alzheimer's disease, where a protein, instead of folding into the correct structure, misfolds and folds in incorrect of correct structure. And these are the sorts of things that we expect uh, will uh, form in Alzheimer's disease, forming both the amyloid plaques and the neurofibrillary tangles. So I'm gonna take you through a little bit more about that now. So um, this is um, an Alzheimer's brain. What you can see here on the left-hand side is a healthy brain, and on the right-hand side, an advanced Alzheimer's brain. So you can see already there are big differences here, and we call this neurodegeneration, where we see um, these big vacuoles and shrinkage of the brain generally. Um, and I'm just going to focus specifically on amyloid beta here. So amyloid beta is found in these amyloid plaques within the brain tissue, and these amyloid plaques within the brain tissue are made up of these amyloid fibrils, and you can see this under an electron microscope, you can see all these long, long fibres, and each one of these amyloid fibres is made of a very, very specific structure. So earlier on, I mentioned alpha helices and beta sheets, and these structures are made of beta sheets. And I often use the analogy that this is a bit like the rungs of a ladder. So each one of these strands is uh, perhaps a protein chain, and it then stacks up via hydrogen bonding, forming a very, very um, tough, very stable structure that then deposits in the, in the brain tissue um, and can't be removed by the normal biological processes. And so, for example, if we used amyloid beta to think about how this structure might form, uh, this is the structure of amyloid beta. It forms this little hairpin structure. So each one of these is a beta strand. And now the next uh, molecule of amyloid beta comes in, hydrogen bonds, and forms another one on the stack. And that would continue up until we form this long amyloid fibril. So essentially, this is amyloid protein assembly. 
Um, and we can sort of depict that in a more um, general way um, using this sort of schematic where I'm not using um, structure anymore, but more sort of squiggly things and blobs. Uh, so this is our protein, protein chain that perhaps has just been made. And it starts to self-associate or uh, stick together with the same, uh, another molecule of the same protein to start to form a lamyloid beta aggregate, which then starts to form an oligomer. And you'll notice that I mentioned this as toxic oligomer, and I'll mention why that is in a moment. And then these, these oligomers start to stack up and start to elongate until finally they form an amyloid fibril, and then lots of these amyloid fibrils then get deposited in the brain tissue as amyloid plaques. And sometimes I use the analogy of a, of a sort of Jenga, where you can build up this structure. The reason I call this a toxic oligomer is because it turns out that rather than these fibres that are deposited in the tissue being the main toxic species, we actually believe um, in the research community that it's these smaller species that form as the aggregation um, progresses that are actually the most important and most toxic form that cause the neurodegeneration. So I just want to go back to amyloid structure again now and show you a little movie that hopefully um, will explain that beta sheet structure that's really important here. So this is a little movie. Um, this was actually, I've put the name here. This was um, built by someone in my lab called Kyle Morris. He was a PhD student. And these are beta strands. So these are our protein chains. And what you can see here with these little dots is hydrogen bonding. So hopefully you can appreciate this, this massive network of hydrogen bonding makes it very, very stable. It's like putting nails in the structure. And now if we look down the fiber axis, what we can see is the amino acid side chains uh, basically interdigitating to form this stable structure. So what this shows you is the structure of a protofilament. So all these beta strands, very, very repetitive structure. So that really takes you through the structure of the amyloid. Uh, but what about what they're actually doing? What, how might it be that those toxic oligomers might be causing disease? So I'm just going to uh, give you a little bit of an introduction to that. So to do that, we need to think about cells. So this is our brain cell. This is a, a, a very simple picture of a brain cell. And there are a few things within a brain cell or any cell, actually, that you need to know about. So first of all, this gray structure here is the nucleus and it, enclo it encloses all of the genetic material um, that makes the proteins in the cell. So that's central here. Then we have these things which are called mitochondria, and these mitochondria uh, produce power. So essentially they make all of the energy that the cell needs in order to survive. Um, and they also make toxic species as a sort of um, side product. That's important. Uh, then we have these little dustbins, which are uh, called lysosomes, and they degrade proteins. So proteins are made and then they uh, exist for some amount of time and then they're degraded again. And that then reproduces all of those amino acids that make up the proteins so that we can make more proteins again. So we have to keep turning over those proteins. Uh, in a... Um, in a particularly in a, in a brain cell or a neuron, we have to transport cargo from this end of the cell, which is sort of the business end, to the other end. And often this, um, this is known as the axon and it's quite long. So we need lots of proteins and uh, machinery that transport things from one end to the other. And the reason that's really important in neurons is because this is uh, the connection between one cell and the next. So in order to uh, pass on messages, perhaps, you know, like a, a memory or whatever, you need to be able to provide information and energy to this end of the cell. So this is known as the synapse. And the reason I've got a little giraffe here is really just to remind me how long these axons can be. So in a giraffe, it can be um, pretty much the length um, from, from the head to the foot. Um, so that's the synapse connections. Um, the other thing I should mention that each of these um, structures known as organelles are surrounded by a, a membrane and the membrane is made of this fatty material, these lipids. And so the cell itself is completely encompassed by this, um, these membranes and each one of these organelles is also um, encompassed by these memory, uh, membranes. So it's been really important to think about whether the membranes might be important in that toxic process. So that's one of the theories that we and other researchers have developed. So first of all, what we want to see is what happens to a, a cell, a brain cell, when we treat it with amyloid beta.
Um, so this is a cell, uh, this is a, a light micrograph of a cell, and the cell has been um, treated with something that stains it green so that you can see it. And you may be able to see here, this is blue, this is the nucleus. So this hasn't been treated with anything. This looks like a neuron might look. And now we add some toxic amyloid beta, which has been stained with a red dye. And so we can see it entering these cells and accumulating within these cells. And at the moment, we don't necessarily know where these might be found, but it's important to think about what, what um, toxic effect might, they might be having on these cells. So what I'm going to show you in the next slide is um, a little bit more information about that. So this is a very busy slide, so I'm going to take you through it um, slowly. So this is amyloid beta. And so, as I've said already, amyloid beta goes from small oligomeric species. This is an electron micrograph. It starts to grow. It forms protofibrils, small uh, elongated filaments, uh, and then lots of fibrils. And finally, this sort of amyloid plaque-like structures. We can take these small species and we can add them to... Um, neuronal cells, and these are, are proper neuronal cells in culture. Hopefully you can see those here. And if I now start to play this little movie, what you'll see is that you see accumulation of the red labeled amyloid beta inside these cells. So that's being internalized into the cells and causing some sort of toxic effects, because we know that after some time, these cells start to die. Uh, if we do the same sort of thing with tau, so these are neurofibrillary tangles that we can grow using tau in our test tube in the lab. And we can do the same sort of thing where we can take these uh, tau structures and add them to cells and see what happens as that accumulates. And this time the tau is going to be green. So hopefully you can see here, these are the neurons. And as you see, again, we see that green structure accumulating inside these cells. And what we think is that these are accumulating within lysosomes. So that's really interesting. So this is a, a larger um, image. So you can see the green structures of tau all inside these cells. And actually what you start to see in this case is that this cell actually starts to die. So it becomes more and more rounded and then eventually it sort of disappears. So we know that both of these are toxic and we also know that they get internalized into the cells and we think that they get internalized into those lysosomes. So those lysosomes were the area in which the cell is, um, the cell is able to turn over proteins. And we know that those lysosomes are absolutely essential for the life of the cell. So I'm gonna um, move on now to a more general um, part of the talk, which, Really, it states that this is a really complicated disease. And I, I, I mentioned that right at the beginning when I said that this was called untangling. So we need to think about what's happening in the external environment, what's happening with our lifestyle, with pollution and infection and so on. And then we can also consider what's happening in our physiological environment. So in terms of ourselves, our genetics, our immunity, um, aging and so on. And then we can think about the cellular environment. So instead of looking at us as a whole, but looking at each cell, um, we might think about um, epigenetics and the way that proteins manage themselves. So this is known as proteostasis. Uh, and then we can zoom in even more uh, into the effects of A beta, the effects of tau, and what happens in terms of neurodegeneration. So now I want to move on just thinking about therapies. What is it that we can be doing um, to try and um, cope with this disease? So there are a number, number of therapies in pipeline. So you may have heard about antibody therapies. So these are essentially like vaccines and they're being developed against those pathological proteins to try and develop them, to try to uh, stop the development of those structures um, and remove them from our, our brain tissue. Um, there are also protein aggregation inhibitors. So as we've seen, that protein aggregation or self-assembly of those proteins is really important in the pathologi pathological process. So um, inhibitors of this process are being developed, small molecules that can bind to the proteins and stop them from aggregating. And that seems to be um, quite, um, quite encouraging at the moment. Um, and then also secondary effects that we know that there's an inflammatory response which is raised when those proteins are deposited. And so there may be a way of reducing that inflammatory response um, and helping people to recover from it. 
Um, and finally, finally, there's been some really exciting um, new um, work, particularly in the Huntington's um, area, so Huntington's disease, uh, where we can reduce the amount of protein that's being produced. So we don't want to reduce the protein completely because that protein might be doing something really useful, but it might be possible to reduce the um, amount of protein that's reduced by doing some gene silencing. Um, and so... Um, this is an example um, from the BBC News where um, this, this surgeon um, was actually treated with a, a gene silencing drug uh, which reduced his um, likelihood of getting Huntington's disease. So when we're thinking about how we treat out, um, Alzheimer's disease, we really need to understand the disease mechanism. So it's no good making a drug that we don't really understand how it works. We really need to know how the disease develops and where the targets are. Most importantly, it is essential to get early diagnosis because we know that there's quite a bit of damage has been done when people start to show uh, real symptoms of memory loss and so on. So if we could find a way of diagnosing people before they start to show symptoms, then it would be possible to treat them early. And so prevention is key rather than cure. So we would want to prevent the disease from developing uh, rather than treat people when you've, the symptoms have already occurred. And, it, and on a very positive note, and this is actually um, partly from a quote from uh, Bart Struper, who runs the Dementia Research Institute, he said that we may already have the drugs that are needed to prevent dementia. And the problem is that we haven't been able to treat people early enough to be able um, to see if those will work. And so finally, I want to finish, finish by um, thanking all of the people that have made this possible. So there's a little montage collage of all the people um, that are involved in my lab who've been working on our projects and so on. We've been very lucky to um, have donations from um, various uh, very, very kind and generous people. Um, I just particularly want to mention um, Mr. Michael Chowan um, and others and support from the Alzheimer's Society particularly. We also get funding from Alzheimer's Research. UK, as well as uh, BBSLC, um, the Royal Society, um, and the Medical Research Council. And I should also mention Tau Therapeutics, Tower X Therapeutics, which is a um, company based in Aberdeen that is um, it, we're working with to try to help us to understand how um, we can treat Alzheimer's disease. So that's really exciting. So I will finish with a, a wise uh, little owl and uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you very much. Well, we hope you enjoyed this video. Once again, I've got to ask, if you did enjoy it, please give the video a like and subscribe to our channel to see our future updates. If you're interested in the future talks we've got coming up, do visit our website at bit.ly slash Sussex Universe. And remember, if you're watching live, the live Q&A starts now at the Zoom link in the description down below.